Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to get to speak with you today. Um, the White House just put out uh, last week a report on millennials, uh, which some of you may have seen. And if you hadn't, haven't uh, seen it, I'm here to tell you what, what we put in it and why we thought it was important to think about millennials. So one of the things at the Council of Economic Advisors we try to do is take a long run look at where we see economic growth going, um, how we see the economy changing, and how we see the labor market changing. Um, we earlier this year released um, a very um, intensive report on what we saw happening with labor force participation, um, which pointed out that uh, you know, the half of the decline in labor force participation since 2007 is due to the aging population. And that aging of the population is also keeping down potential growth rates um, for uh, many decades to come. So the other end of that spectrum is to say, well, what's going on with young workers today? And the most obvious thing is that, um, particularly for millennials, many of them came of age at a time when unemployment was high. And the very unfortunate fact is that research shows that when you enter the labor market when unemployment is high, uh, it has negative effects that persist for many decades, maybe even for your entire lifetime. So that's kind of a depressing place to start. But uh, let me step back and say, so what we wanted to do was look at what makes this generation unique, what we think are the particular advantages of this generation, and then how do we think about it in the context of a generation that got hit by uh, coming of age in the worst uh, downturn since the Great Depression. So uh, we started with the fact that all of you know, which is that millennials are uh, large and diverse, the largest generation at this point and the most diverse. One of the things that I didn't know when we started on this, though, is that a lot of that diversity comes from the fact that there is a larger share foreign, that are, uh, of young adults who were foreign born. This is not new to US history. It's actually a return to the kind of immigration patterns we saw at the beginning of the last century. So having 15% of the of 20 to 34 year olds being foreign born is consistent with the kind of things we saw in the 1920s and actually a little bit lower than what we saw in the in 1900, 1910, uh, but much higher than what we saw, you know, as recently as 1990. Uh, so that uh, the next thing we took a look at was just what are, you know, what are the characteristics of millennials? And I'll I'll tell you. Um, my background, you heard, is that I'm an academic, and I have done a lot of research on understanding um, why you in the in the U.S and actually around the world, women's life satisfaction has declined over time relative to, to men's. That's a topic for a different day. But it led me to spend a lot of time looking at how young people view the world and the types of experiences that young people have to try to understand where, where these uh, views of life satisfaction were coming from. And what I learned from that when I looked at um, surveys of 17 and 18 year olds is that first of all, when we think about balancing work and family, we're actually missing something that's really important to people's lives, which is community. And millennials, perhaps more than even other generations, really value community and their role in the community. Uh, making a contribution to society is incredibly important to millennials, more important than it was to Gen Xers or to baby boomers. Um, being uh, able to be a leader in their community is very important to millennials more so than uh, to Gen Xers or baby boomers. So that idea that there are three domains that people are trying to figure out, work, family, and community, uh, was something that I learned from these, these surveys of young people that go back uh, to the 1970s. So you can consistently say, w what did boomers think when they were leaving high school? What did Gen Xers think and what do millennials think? We also uh, learned that millennials really value staying close to their friends and family. This is sort of like a teaser, hint, hint. Will millennials stay home with their parents? Because when they were 18 or 17, half of them said living close to their family was important to them compared to 29% of baby boomers. So there's been a real shift in, in how the relationship that millennials have with their parents. Uh, again, I, I have a 
some research from many years ago which looked at the fact that the parents of millennials were investing more in their kids, more likely to breastfeed, more likely to spend time with them when they were young, more likely to be uh, involved in homework. Both dads and moms spent more, out, spent more hours in the 90s and the 2000s parenting than they did in the 70s or 80s. Um, as a parent, I'm pleased to see that that actually pays off. Your kids like you more when you spend more time with them rather than the opposite. <laughs> um, the, uh, the other thing that we, um, that's really important to know about millennials is that they do have an ace in their pocket to overcome this recession, which is that they're the most educated of any generation. And this has been an upward trend. People are becoming more educated over time. But obviously, there's a real difference when the majority of your generation is college educated compared to a much smaller fraction. And uh, millennials um, are 47, in, tw in 2013, 47% of 25 to 34 year olds received a post secondary degree. That was 31% in not just 1992. So when I was coming out of college, uh, as a college graduate, I was still uh, much more of a minority of my generation. The kids graduating from college today, a little bit less so. And uh, again, that might help you think about the types of obstacles they face, but also the types of opportunities they have with that human capital education, that human capital acquisition. The other thing um, that we showed was that the uh, there have been, uh, in recent years, significant closures and racial gaps in educational attainment, um, particularly with uh, rapid increases in the enrollment rates of 18 to 24 year old Hispanics um, that have closed a, a gap in which Hispanics were less likely to be enrolled than blacks um, and are narrowing, uh, significantly narrowed the gap between Hispanics and whites. Now, uh, what this means, though, is that millennials are more in debt. Because more of them have gone to college, it's not just the lucky ones that come from well-off families where they've been able to get their parents to help pay who've gone to college, but it's been uh, lots of kids who had to rely on funding for, uh, for college uh, through uh, student loans. And uh, there is a graph, there's a deck that's been passed around, and if you um, look at slide, uh, page four, you can see there's a figure from the report which shows that um, a big chunk of the increase um, in student loan comes from changes in enrollment and the share of borrowers. Some of it obviously comes from real net tuition increases um, and expenses, but more of it comes from just changes in who the borrowers are. So that raises real questions. Not about how do we continue to fund higher education at a time when larger shares of people are getting higher education. But on the, the good news, the other thing we show there is that among people who graduate, only 3.7% of borrowers uh, defaulted on their loans within six years um, after their initial post-secondary enrollment. So, Graduation is something that's actually really important for people to be able to manage their loans. Uh, and I think that's probably not surprising to, to anyone. The other uh, thing that is, of course, uh, different for this generation uh, that's on the plus side is this generation has had better access to health care. And that has come specifically from uh, the ACA and the provis provisions that have allowed young people to stay on their parents' health plans. Um, the uh, the uninsurance rate among 19 to 25 year olds was pretty consistent around 35% uh, prior to the ACA and uh, it has now fallen uh, by 40% and is now 20.9%. So uh, real action to bring the, the, the share that are uninsured down. And the hope is that also gives freedom for millennials to be pursuing things like uh, innovation, small businesses, startups, things where they're not worried about whether they have health insurance because they can get it through um, the ACA. There, we've also taken a look to see how much they've recovered. Across the board, what we see is the labor market's about 80% recovered. Um, so unemployment rates are coming back down. Uh, they have a little bit farther to go. Um, they're about 80% uh, of the way there. And that is true even when we measure across really broad uh, ways of considering discouraged workers or marginally attached workers. 
Uh, a couple things to note, which is that young people always have higher unemployment rates. So a full recovery for young people still likely means higher unemployment rates than one uh, wishes they had. The uh, other thing to note is that we do have an, still have uh, a more elevated part-time for economic reasons rate. What does that mean? That means people telling us they're working under 35 hours who wish they were working more hours. And I think that's a really important thing for us to be paying attention to to understand whether people are able to transition into the jobs that they want. The, uh, we, and we, one of the things we cover in the report is the fact that we've seen fewer labor market transitions, which is particularly problematic for, uh, for young people. Young people get a lot of wage increases in their 20s. Those wage increases are really important uh, because that's you know, sort of the path uh, to career enhancements and higher earnings over their lifetime. And this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to enter the labor market or to be in the labor market in your 20s when there's a period of enormous instability or lower job creation, higher unemployment, because you uh, young people rely on changing jobs, getting promotions, to sort of climb uh, what us economists call the age wage profile, uh, to be able to get to the top of the hill where you're earning more, uh, which typically happens in your sort of mid-30s. If you're not able to climb those stairs in your 20s, uh, you can find yourself uh, falling behind, and it can be difficult to make that up later on. Again, the hope is that the higher educational attainment uh, of millennials is going to inoculate against some of that. But it is something, certainly, as an administration and government that we're paying attention to, uh, making sure that we're developing other training programs, that we're working with employers to facilitate the hiring of the long-term unemployed, which is a problem for millennials as well as older workers, um, and seeing sort of making sure that we're doing everything we can to have people get fully uh, back in the labor market to the greatest extent possible. The, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff to cover uh, that, that's in this report. Uh, let me just highlight um, uh, couple, two more things. Um, one is that you already, I already told you millennials are more likely to live with their parents, um, and, uh, and that is true. They're also less likely to own a home, but they're less the decline in them owning a home is actually not that far below uh, a time trend line. In other words, they're not really that far below in terms of home ownership uh, compared to where one might have predicted they would be um, if we hadn't had a recession. They are much more likely to live with their parents, so you can see that there's what's, some of what's being crowded out is living in the kind of um, ridiculous multi-roommate situations that I lived in uh, when I was in, in my 20s, including living in a fraternity house at one point. Um, I can see why living with your parents could beat that. Uh, I really can. Uh, so um, some, of, some of that's what's going on. Um, but there is a, a little, there is lower household formation and a lower headship rate. There are many factors that can explain that. Not getting promotions, not getting raises, um, being in school longer, um, all of these things contribute. And the other thing is that um, for many generations, people have been marrying later and they've been having their kids later. And millennials are no different. They're having their kids later, and they're marrying later, even later. So they're, uh, you know, we see age of first birth at a very uh, higher rate than we've seen in the past. We see the percent uh, married in, who are sort of 25 to 34 lower than we've seen in the past. And, um, but uh, the one thing that, you know, that I think makes it very difficult to predict what will ultimately happen is that um, what we've seen with previous generations is this is mostly about marriage delayed. So, you know, if you looked at unmarried 35 year olds in 2000, you saw that uh, a large share of them, and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't remember off the top of my head, but had married within the next 10 years by, the, by 2010 when they were 45. So there's just a lot of marriage that goes on later in life today that didn't used to go on, uh, which makes it difficult to know uh, how much they will marry. But of course, but, uh, uh, and whether this is an effect whether the declines is somewhat driven by the economy or how much of it is just driven by the sort of patterns we've been seeing over time from generation to generation. And the last pattern that I will talk about is 
uh, the fact that millennial women have more labor market equality than previous generations. And uh, we looked across a variety of measures, higher hourly earnings, higher uh, mean earnings, higher labor force participation, more likely to be employed than 18 to 34 year olds in the past. And of course, this is a great thing because they're also more likely to be educated than millennial men. Uh, so we certainly want to make sure millennial women are able to participate and able to uh, work in whatever occupations they choose because they have a lot of skills and a lot of education. Um, and making sure that we're ad adopting policies that help them figure out um, and help millennial men figure out how they're going to balance work, family, and community as an important goal of this administration. So why don't I end there? And uh, I don't know if we were supposed to set this up for questions. Um, and you want to take a yeah, sure. Hi. Um, Switch, oh, hey, I talk loud. <laughs> um, does the tendency to switch jobs less that you guys found, does that break down by uh, um, education level or by uh, job type? Like level, like professional versus not professional, low wage jobs? Um, so I, what I can tell you is this is being seen across the board. So I can't, I didn't, I, have, I don't know the answer to that for millennials exactly. But this idea that people are switching jobs less, staying with their employer more, um, is happening across the board, across age groups, and has been happening over time uh, for many decades. So there is a decline in new firms opening. There is a decline in job uh, switching behavior, and millennials aren't that different from other people in that respect, but it, it, the, the, it is still at a lower level today than young people have experienced in the past, and we're still trying to figure out what that's going to mean for them. On the one hand, it can be great to stay with an employer who wants to invest in you. They think you're not going to leave um, because people tend to be in more stable jobs. On the other hand, if it's because there's a lack of opportunity to move to something better, then we want to make sure that we are um, removing any obstacles that are creating a lack of opportunity because we want people to obviously be able to shift jobs uh, to be able to be as productive as possible. But it is a, across the board, when you're looking across all ages, it is sort of an across the board phenomenon that's not related to one particular industry or one particular education group or, uh, or age group. Bill Emmons of the St. Louis Fed. Could you speak a little bit about the outlook for black and Hispanic millennials? Um, yeah, so, I mean, what we've seen, uh, in, so there's a, a couple things there. One is that when we look at the recovery, we see that there's similar percent recovered, but of course they're recovering to higher unemployment rates. So the uh, persistent ongoing challenges that, um, that that young people of color, particularly uh, uh, blacks and Hispanics, have faced are ongoing. So I think, you know, um, so then there's a, a number of things that uh, we have been thinking about in terms of how to address it. One of the issues, there's particular challenges for young men of color, and that is being addressed in the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative. And, uh, you know, there, there are some really um, daunting statistics. You know, uh, young men of color are half as likely to be employed today as they were in 1950. Half as likely as a big decline, um, a sort of jaw-dropping decline. So, you know, making sure that we're doing, you know, again, everything we can to help people reach their full potential um, means focusing particularly on people who've had them face the greatest challenges, and that includes uh, young people of, of color. The, uh, the other, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there's sort of other policy aspects that I think are really important. I mean, you know, the, the fact that um, the ACA provides access to insurance is particularly important for lower income workers. The push on 
for increase, uh, increased minimum wage is particularly important for lower wage workers. Um, and so there's a, a number of initiatives that are being taken to sort of address workers across the spectrum, increasing access to apprenticeship programs um, and making sure that there's uh, more access for women and more access for, for people of color as part of the things that uh, have been taken on. But you know the ongoing challenges that were present before the recession are still there. And one of the things that we've been doing in the administration is now that we see you know, that we're you know, that we, the recovery is ongoing, we need to go back and address some of these ongoing challenges um, related that, uh, you know, wage stagnation um, and uh, labor force participation and a bunch of ongoing problems because those things aren't going to recover naturally. They're going to require some sort of active push. Great. Thank you guys so much. It was great talking with you.